Okay, so we meet for the last time this semester and we want to look at the resolution method. For FOL essentially. Okay, so as I might have mentioned earlier, it was a method which was introduced by Alan Robinson in 1965 and since then it has been used extensively in theorem proving. Uh, so things like for example, the proof for Fermat's last theorem had extensive support from programs which were based on resolution method eventually and it is a complete method for uh, proving a theorem or proving something uh, which uses only one rule of inference which is the resolution rule and it does not need any other axioms essentially. Now talking more generally about logic. Uh, as we said that logic is basically a system in which you define a language and then define some rules of inference in that language, define the meaning of sentences in that language and then talk about uh, soundness and completeness. And as you define more and more expressive languages, so we have seen only one step, we have moved from proportional logic to first order logic uh, in which we said that we can talk about variables and quantifiers over variables. It was shown by Godel in his theorem which was called Godel's completeness theorem that first order logic is sound and complete essentially which means you can always devise a first order logic system which is sound and which is complete and by complete we mean anything which is entailed by a set of statements can be derived using that machinery that we are building essentially. It turns out that that FOL is sound complete but it is only semi decidable. And what this means is that in particular it, the way it applies to FOL is as follows that if you give a true statement or statement which is entailed to the system and ask the system to prove it, then there exists a proof for that statement in that system essentially. And you can always devise a strategy and you can imagine the strategy is something like breadth first search that always you know find the nearest inferences first and eventually you will go farther and farther away and eventually you will find the proof. So, you can always devise a strategy to for finding a proof. But if you give a statement which is not true, then the system may never halt because there is no proof and the system may never come out saying that there is no proof. Now in the case of proportional logic because we are only dealing with a countably countable set of propositions and usually it is finite we can always say that uh, at least for finite set of propositions we can always say that there is no proof because we can try all combinations and eventually say that there is no way that this can this statement can be true. So, even if it is false we can come out and say false. In the case of first order logic we cannot come out and say that your statement is false essentially. You can only keep trying essentially which uh, boils down to saying that your program can get into an infinite loop essentially and which is of course not surprising that we have written all of us have written programs which get into infinite loop. Of course, most of our programs get into infinite loops in imperative languages because we have written it a, a, a long a wrong loop or, or a wrong ex exit criteria. In logic programming or prolog, we do not control the flow of execution, we simply state what is to be then. Of course, we do control it in the order in which we write statements because as we observed prolog does depth first search essentially top to down and, and left to right which means that if you write statements in a long order it is possible that it could get it in, into get into a uh, infinite loop. But even if you write statements in the correct order if the, if the statement that you are trying to prove is not true it can still get into an infinite loop essentially. Okay. So, today uh, we will we'll go back to this example that we saw 
uh, and so on a b on b c and let us on table c and lean a Supposing this is given to you, this is a set of facts given to you and you want to show that there exists an x and there exists a y such that on x, y and lean x and not lean y. This is a goal that you want to show to be true and that is the facts given to you. Now you can see that forward chaining, backward chaining does not make sense here because in your, in your database or knowledge base there are no implication statements. Both forward chaining and backward chaining move sort of allow you to move across implication statements. So, if you have alpha implies beta then if you have alpha then you can say yes beta is there or if you have the goal beta you can say the go alpha can be a goal. But there are no implication statements here given this set of facts and we are asked to show this here. So, you can imagine that forward chaining and backward chaining does not work at all essentially. So, you must of course convince yourself that this statement is true and as human beings we might use one technique which is called looking at the different cases of proof by cases we could say uh, take the case when x is a and y is b or, or look at b. So, there are two cases that either b is green or b is not green. If b is green then x is equal to b and y is equal to c and b is on c and b is green and y is not green. If b is not green then you can say x equal to a and y is equal to b and a is green and b is not green. So, whether b is green or whether b is not green you can show that in either of the two cases this statement is true and if, if you further say that this, this is the only possibility that one of them is true then you can argue that yes this statement must be true essentially. So, this this statement which I slipped in between which says that if you argue that one only one of them is true is essentially a part of classical logic. In classical logic every statement is either true or false and there is nothing in between. So, it is called the law of excluded middle essentially which some people object to. Uh, because of statements like this that I can say that p or not p is true or q or not q is true. So, this is a true statement why because of the law of excluded middle either p must be true or not p must be true. So, in which case this disjunct is true and this disjunct is true and both are true. So, I can shuffle this and write it as not p or q or not q or t and then which I can write as p implies q or q implies t. So, this is true for any two statements p and q whether they are in any language first order or professional or higher order language it does not matter. And if you treat implication as implies in the causal sense then people have difficulty with such statements because let us imagine that P stands for the earth is flat and Q stands for the moon is green. Then you are saying that there is a causal connection between these two things that the earth is flat and the moon is green that either the earth is flat implies that the moon is green or the fact that moon is green implies that the earth is flat essentially. Now, obviously, there is no causal connection between these two statements you take any two statements p and q and this statement is a tautology and it is always true essentially. So, which is why sometimes logicians tend to distinguish between logics with 
capture causal relationships and we will not go into that, but rather they would see that instead of reading it as an implication here, you must read it like this. So, when you say P implies Q, it is easier to read it as this without getting worked up about it. It says that either P is false or Q is true, that is all you are saying essentially. But when we read it as an implication, we have this sense of it being a causal relationship, which is not really the case essentially. Okay. Now, let us get back to the resolution method and uh, uh, before we do that, we want to look at this algorithm called unification algorithm, which is a very famous algorithm. What unification algorithm does is that it takes two patterns, we will use a more generic term than formulas and tries to unify them which means tries to find a substitution which will make them the same essentially. These patterns are made up of two kinds of things, one, are, one is constant and one is variable and variable is something that you can substitute something for the other and constants are or atoms as some people call it cannot be substituted, cannot be changed, they are this thing. So, for the sake of simplicity, we will adopt a slightly different notation. Supposing I have this statement, uh, man x or well, let us say not man x or mortal x. Now, this statement which is in the mathematical language of logic has this particular notation that you have the predicate name or it could be the function name in some situations uh, followed by brackets, followed by the arguments uh, and then predicates connected using logical connectives essentially. So, you have to distinguish between different kinds of things. For the sake of this unification algorithm, let us assume that we have a uniform notation and the notation in that notation what this will look like is uh, that I will use all here and the notation uses a question mark as a thing for variable. This is just for the sake of understanding this algorithm easily. You can always adapt the algorithm to this notation, but this is simply easier to use because it is a very uniform list like notation, which those of you who have used list would be happier to look at essentially. So, I have moved the or sign outside. So, the, the outermost connective is first and then the inner connective which is not here. So, not man is written like this. So, not so, this whole thing from this bracket to this bracket is one expression or term, if you, we will just call it a term or a list. So, from here to here is a list which is, so the first one is always a connective, the first element in the list is always a connective or a predicate name in this case. So, here predicate name is differentiated and you know connective. So, the first thing is in this case it is a predicate name man, here it is a connective, here it is a connective. So, this has got these two arguments, this whole thing is one thing and this whole thing is another thing. So, it is a list of three elements. So, everything is a list of some number of elements and the only thing we need to worry about is that either something is a constant or an atom as the list people say or it is a variable essentially. So, and the only the point about that is an atom can only mat an, match an atom. So, if I am matching this with, uh, uh, if I want to match this with man Socrates. So, what, what am I trying to do? I am trying to do something like resolution, if you recall, I have this clause and I have this clause and I have something here 
and I have the negation of that thing here. So, resolution rule if you remember always first of all it works in clause form that it that you must express things in CNF like form and then you have to look for something versus and its negation a, a positive literal and a negation negative literal and in some sense cancel it out essentially and from there you can derive mortal legs essentially. So, which means of course, I will have to match this man x with mortal x with man Socrates which is what the unification algorithm will allow me to do it will tell me what values for x will make these two expressions the same. In our case we have just called it as a list here essentially. So, to match this with this of course, the predicate name must be the same. So, we are just treating it as an atom here which means it can only match a, another atom which is the same as man not can only match not or can only match or it is only the variables which can match something else. So, let us assume that we have an arbitrary nested pattern which is expressed as a list of this kind and we want to write a general algorithm which will find a unifier for any two patterns or a substitution for those two patterns which will make it the same. This substitution is called a unifier and that is the algorithm that we are looking for unification algorithm. So, the algorithm is called let us say it is called unify. So, I will just sketch it here and you can fill in the details. So, let us say x y and what this does is it. So, I will write it in a prologue like fashion this part at least uh, sub unify x y. So, like we do in when very often we write a program we add a third parameter to make life simpler for us we have added an empty list and call this with sub, uni, sub unify and what this is going to be is the substitution. So, obviously, when we call it when we call we, so x and y are any any such list arbitrary list we start off by supplying an empty substitution. So, now we are interested in this sub unify. So, x y theta where theta is a substitution we are trying to build. What is a substitution? A substitution is a collection of variable value pairs essentially. It says x equal to x should be substituted by this, y should be substituted by this and so on which will make the two patterns the same essentially. And this algorithm goes through a series of cases. I will just list out the salient ones here. Uh, so, obviously, if x and y are the same whether they are atom or whether they are a list then you do not need to do anything they are already unified essentially. So, so some of the main cases are follows. So, these are cases. Uh, so, I just write it as if. Uh, so, let us understand this to mean that x is a variable then call another function call where unify x y theta. So, if one of them is a variable then it is a candidate for being substituted by something else and that this function where unify will do. Uh, likewise, if y is a variable you can also call where unify with y x and theta. Somewhere, so th this order may not be the perfect order I am writing here. If uh, atom x then if x equal to y return theta else
Hmm. So, if x is an atom, if the argument that we are trying to unify, so this is going to be a recursive program. Uh, so, this x and y initially will be such bigger patterns, but eventually when we drill down into, into the list, at some point they will be either a variable or an atom. So, if it is a variable then we just call it call very unify with the other argument, if it is an atom we check whether it is matching or not essentially. So, if it is not a variable and if it is not an atom it must be a list, uh, then we say if length x is not equal to length it is a list, so we can compute its length return fail. If the two lists are of unequal length, then you can never make them match. Else make recursive calls. So, make uh, I will just write it like this. Okay. Appropriate recursive calls. What does that mean? That, for example, if this is one of my arguments, if this is x, and this x has a list of three elements. The first element is this constant, or the second element is this list, which is this whole thing, and the third element is this other list. So, if I have another list of three elements, I can try to match that, and then I will make recursive calls once with this, with this, then another with this, and another with this. So, I will incrementally build a substitution. So, that leaves with us with the task of writing that where unify which is really building the substitution. So, okay, I might have skipped one or two small details it does not matter x. So, when you make a call to where unify we know that x is a variable, the other thing could be a list or it could be something else. So, let us say this is a variable and y and theta, we know that the first thing is a variable essentially. We have to do a, a few checks, so essentially what we really want to do is to say add where equal to y to my theta add one more substitution, but before doing that I want to do, so what, what do I want to do? I want to say return theta union where equal to y. I want to basically add one more substitution which is the call I am making, but is am I allowed to do that? I have to do a couple of checks first. Uh, first is if where is already equal to y, then you can just return theta, you do not have to do anything else. It could be the case, for example, I am comparing, uh, well these are not variables in this case, so it does not matter, but it could be that they are the same variable, then you just return theta. Then if variable occurs, return fail. So, if the variable happens to occur in y then you return fail. So, let me use an example to illustrate why this is needed and this example is from this book by Charniak and McDermott which describes it in this notation. So, the example is as follows not C's x So, let us say C stands for a predicate and the meaning of C is that the first argument can see the second argument. So, for example, I see you or things like that and this is a universally quantified statement. It is saying that for all x, let us assume that x is people, x cannot see x which means one cannot see oneself essentially. 
So, let us assume that that is a true statement and I have a rule which and let us say I am doing forward chaining and the rule is as follows. Again I am writing it in this new notation where instead of writing the implication sign I will write an if here then the antecedent and then the consequent. So, instead of saying this implies that consequent I am writing it in this list like notation which Charniak and McDermott they use which is quite a nice notation to use easy to process. So, this rule says So, you always worry about the number of brackets in this sort of a thing. Hmm. So, what does this rule say? It is a universally quantified statement. How would you read it in English? So, phi it is a function. Remember that in first order logic, the arguments to predicates can only be terms and terms are either variables or that or constants or functions. So, phi of z is function. So, let us say phi of z stand for z s phi. So, this is saying that if anyone cannot see their phi they should diet exactly which may be a true statement of course, I do not know. Now, the question is should, should this rule and this these two rules can we apply forward chaining here to infer that everyone should diet? Not given these two facts, right? So, let us see how that particular statement that we are talking about if variable occurs in y then return failure comes to our rescue. Uh, so, we are trying to unify this with this. Remember mode exponents or modified mode exponents, the antecedent should match. Right? Now, we will make recursive calls first, you see that this is a list of two arguments, then we will make two recursive calls, one with the first argument and one with the second argument. Then the first, arg first call, this is an atom and this matches this, so that is fine. So, the first recursive call will work and it will not change theta at all. The second recursive call has a list of three elements and this also has a list of three elements. So, that is fine. First, we will make a call with C's and C's here. If uh, in the first call this case will come, if, if this is an atom and this is a same atom then do nothing. In the second call we will do this. So, our algorithm will say okay, x is a variable. Uh, so, I will call where unify with x and uh, x and z and then in the last statement which I will reach there, I will say add x is equal to z. I am not writing the question marks here uh, to theta. Hmm. So, this will go into theta. So, this is saying that if you want to make these two patterns the same, substitute for x the value z and you will have theta. Now, you have x has already been put as z here. So, so whether, whether you do this here or whether you do this later both ways it works. Uh, in fact, the other, other situation is if where has a value in theta value let us call it z in theta and then if variable already has a value in theta then call sub unify with that value essentially. So, in this example we already have a value z in theta x equal to z. So, if we have not changed this x that clause will kick in. 
and we will call with x n so we, so the recursive call that sub unify call in this line here would be with the value of z so with z and feet of z essentially so let us assume, assume that we have already made this z which is this case where this is happening now you are trying to unify this x which is a variable with feet of so this has become z by now uh, so let me put an arrow here and show that this has become z because we have substituted x with z now we are making a call of a variable z with a list which is feet of z which is a y so this is x in this statement here sorry this is this is where in this statement and this is y and this statement says that if where occurs in y then return fail so in this example z occurs in this pattern or list so the algorithm should return failure saying that we cannot unify this which is good for us because you know then otherwise all of us would have had to die so this doesn't apply and this particular clause here is meant to catch exactly this kind of a thing essentially so you can never unify z with feet of z you know if you substitute feet of z for z then you will have to substitute feet of z for this z also and then the z inside and the z inside and the z inside so it, you know that doesn't make sense okay so this is a unification algorithm uh, and what it returns is a theta which is the most general unifier which can make the two patterns the same so for example if i have a statement uh, p x z and another statement p x let's say a constant a then you can see that i can have one unifier which is x is equal to b and z equal to a that's a unifier i am not saying that this algorithm will find this that's a unifier so that's one unifier and there's another unifier which is simply z equal to a this unifier is more general than this unifier because it does less amount of substitution i mean anything that this does this also does but there is something which this does which this this not which this does not do so this is called more general than this without going into details we will accept that there is a partial order of unifiers and there is something called the most general unifier which is called mgu and this algorithm essentially returns the most general unifier so again without going into details uh, we just accept the fact that it is desirable to find the most general unifier and the reason for that is that you can make the most general inferences from which you can always derive more specific inferences using the universal instantiation rule essentially okay so yeah i'm afraid we don't have to go into details over that but it basically the, it's a standard algorithm which is really popular in theorem proving and we use it all the time so let us uh, address this problem let's see and how the res resolution method will solve this problem so to convert to solve a problem with resolution method you have to convert it into clause form and a clause form is a form 
which looks like fol as follows that there is some number of universal quantifiers x 1 for all x 2 for all x n. Then there is a set of clauses c 1 and c 2 and c k such a formula such a form of a formula is clause form where each c i is d 1 or d d 2 or d r and each d i is equal to l i or negation of l i. So, of course, the inside part you will recognize as a conjunctive normal form a set of clauses which are joined by an and and each clause is basically a disjunction of some some things and each of those things is either a literal which means an atomic statement or the negation of an atomic statement essentially. So, you have pushed the negation side all the way inside and you have removed or thrown away existential quantifiers. Luckily, in our example we do not really have existential quantifiers or at least we will see in a moment that we do not have, but uh, we discussed earlier how to handle existential quantifiers by using the skolem functions and the skolem constants and that can be done. And then rearranging any formula into CNF is something that I am sure you have studied how to do that. And then you move the universal quantifiers outside and when they are together and outside you can just throw it away and use the implicit quantifier form which is what we are doing here essentially. So, what is it? So, if you recall the deduction theorem that we had talked about earlier, it said that to show that this follows from this, you are equivalently showing that this and this and this and this and this entails this. And if you want to use the resolution method, you will re recall that to use the resolution method, you must take the conclusion and take its negation and add it as a clause to your system essentially. So, this is already in clause form, all we need to do is to convert this into take its negation. So, what is the negation of that? The negation of that, if I put a negation sign outside here, I will have to push the negation sign inside because I have to convert it into this clause form. So, this will become for all x for all y not on x y or not lean x or lean y. Yeah. So, once this negation goes inside then it will go inside the ands and convert it into an or. So, remember we have to push the negation sign to the innermost place. So, this will become not on, this will become not green and this negation and negation will cancel and then this will become green y. So, let me write this here uh, on x y or green x or not green y. Okay, so, this is one clause I have. So, I have, I have expressed it in the implicit quantifier form and those are the other things given to us which is on a b and on b c So, let us forget on table c that is not useful for us. I mean you can write it, but it does not help us green a and let us say this on table c is here. Anyway, we do not ne really need that. So, we have this clauses and we want to what is it we want to show that can we derive the null clause from this and we are going to use the unification algorithm along the way. Our example is so simple that we do not really have to use a very complicated recursive version, it is very simply you can match it. So, let us just try this from this 
and this I substitute x equal to a and y is equal to b I get green a or not green b okay so I have not stated the resolution step or the rule for first order logic but you can see that it is very similar to modified mode exponents you do you you apply the substitution and in the resolvent you have the substitution already applied essentially so because I am saying x equal to a and y is equal to b then this becomes a this becomes b and I get this essentially then from this and this I can get similarly uh, green b or not green c hmm. is that correct hmm. this should be negation here right and this should not be negation and this should be negation yeah so all three were wrong right so negation on x y negation green x as seen in that orange thing there and green y essentially so what we get here is not green a and green b and not green B or green C. Hmm? So, is that correct? No, then from this and this, I can get not green B and from this one and this one. If you can keep track of the arrows, I can get green B and from this and this you can get this anti cross. So, just to repeat from on A B and that negated goal. So, remember this is a negated goal that we have added, we get not green A or green B then from on B C and the negative goal we get not green B or green C, but here we have said not green C. So, when we resolve this with this we get not green B only this remains when you resolve this with this this is green A this is not green A. So, you get green B and then we have not green B or green B and from that you get the null clause essentially. So, you can see that there is a simple proof using the resolution method and if you look at the proof carefully you can see that it is trying to in some sense say at the same time that if this formula is to be unsatisfiable if this whole set of formulas which means only this formula because this is accepted to be true this is the premises given to us if this is to be false then it entails that at the same time B must be green and B must not be green and that of course is a contradiction. So, as we discussed earlier the resolution method is like a proof by contradiction essentially. So, if you remember when we talked about forward chaining or backward chaining there is no way you can move from this set of data to this conclusion essentially. The conclusion holds that one there exists a block on another block so that the block on top is green and the block below is not green it is it is not even intuitively clear, but it is true but we cannot derive it using first forward chaining or backward chaining, but in resolution method there is a very simple small proof for doing that. So, in fact this procedure by Allen Robinson was a big breakthrough in logical reasoning automatic theorem proving and nowadays automatic theorem proving is done in many different places for many different applications essentially and the heart of this is this resolution method essentially. 
which is a sound and complete method for first order logic. Okay, so I think uh, we should stop here and with this we will end this course. Uh, I must say I enjoyed teaching the class and I hope some of you at least enjoyed the course I think so. <laughs>